Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar titled Developing and Implementing State Olmstead Plans to Increase Access to Community-Based Services for Adults with Serious Mental Illnesses or Children with Serious Emotional Disturbances. Sponsored by SAMHSA and developed under the TA Coalition contract <clears throat> and presented by the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law. My name is Kelly Maston from the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, and I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Before we introduce today's presenters, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording along with the PowerPoint presentation slides will be sent via email within three to five days to all those who registered. However, you may download the slides now for your convenience at the top of the screen where it says PowerPoint Presentation. Please click on Upload File to download the slides. For participants only, audio is being streamed through your computer speakers with no need to connect by phone unless necessary, in which case the phone number is listed in the notes section on your screen. If you're having any technical difficulties during this webinar, please type your comment in the Q&A pod on the right side of your screen and someone will be able to assist you. Please also type your questions for the presenters in the Q&A pod and at the end of the presentation we will ask as many as we can. At the end of the webinar we will ask you to take a few moments to complete, <clears throat> to complete a short evaluation for us. Please know that we do not offer CEU credits for our webinars, but we'll send you a letter of attendance upon request. My email address will be available at the top of the screen during the evaluation. I would like to thank SAMHSA for allowing us to share this information with you today. And again, thank you for joining us. I will now turn it over to Jennifer Mathis, Director of Policy and Legal, and Legal Advocacy for the Bazelon Center who will introduce today's presenters. Jennifer? Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. So we're excited to be here today on the 21st anniversary of the Olmstead decision. Today's presenters are Estelle Richmond, Kevin Martone, and Harvey Rosenthal. Estelle Richmond has been a key policymaker advancing community integration for people with disabilities at all levels of government over many decades, including national, state, and local government. She's the former secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Public Welfare. She also served as senior advisor to the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, for health and human services issues. While at HUD, she held the positions of chief operating officer and acting deputy secretary overseeing goal setting and outcomes measurement for all major departments as well as authority of regional offices. Prior to joining HUD, Ms. Richmond dedicated more than 30 years of public service to public service at the state and local level. She was appointed secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Public Welfare in 2003, a position she held for seven years. Ms. Richmond also served as the managing director for the city of Philadelphia and director of social services as well as uh, uh, Philadelphia's Commissioner of Public Health and Deputy Commissioner for Mental Health, Mental Retardation, and Substance Abuse Services. Kevin Martone is the Executive Director of the Technical Assistance Collaborative. Kevin is nationally recognized for his expertise in behavioral health policy, system financing and design, Olmstead and community integration, homelessness, and best practice models of housing for persons with disabilities. His 25 years of executive leadership at the national, state, and provider levels in both the public and private sectors have given him a unique understanding of the complexity of systems in these areas. Kevin joined the Technical Assistance Collaborative in 2011 as uh, Director of Behavioral Health before becoming Executive Director in 2012. Before that, he served as the, at the President of the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors. And as Deputy Commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Human Services, Kevin managed a $1.5 billion operating budget and led a statewide systemic transformation of public behavioral health to advance recovery, expand peer-delivered services, improve access to community-based programs, and decrease reliance on acute care. He has since helped several states to implement Olmstead by advancing recovery, community integration, and social inclusion particularly through the use of evidence-based practices, such as permanent supportive housing and care coordination. He is currently the president-elect of the National Association for Rural Mental Health. 
Harvey Rosenthal is the Executive Director of the New York Association of Psychiatric Rehabilitation Services. Harvey has 40 years of experience working to promote public mental health policies and services that advance the recovery, rehabilitation, rights, and full community inclusion of individuals with psychiatric disabilities and or diagnoses. His advocacy has helped to transform state and local, state and national mental health systems, increase access to community-based housing, employment, and support services, and to advance numerous recovery and criminal justice-related mental health reforms. He has helped to create several nationally acclaimed and replicated self-help, employment, and transformational training innovations. Harvey has also worked to fight stigma, discrimination, and human rights violations and to expand informed choice, protections, and cultural competence. His expertise is regularly sought by state and national print, radio, and television reporters. And now we will start the webinar, and I will turn it over to Kevin. Actually, I think Estelle's going to take it, right, Estelle? I think I'm starting I'm sorry, it. to Estelle. Thank yep. you, Jennifer. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jennifer. We have come a long way since 1999. However, we still have a ways to go. While it's good to recognize our progress, this is also an opportunity to recommit our energies to assure that all folks with any type of disability are able to live in the community of their choice, with people of their choice, with housing type of their choice, and have the supports available to be successful. I began my career of working with people with known illness in 1965. For those of you in that age span, that was the height of deinstitutionalization. I was an intern helping people in Cleveland State Hospital prepare to leave the state hospital. In those days, my job was to help people who had been in the state facility for many years become adjusted to a new world. It was enlightening work and clearly helped me understand why deinstitutionalization was critical and integration back in the community was important. In so many ways, the deinstitutional work did not work as planned, but it was the beginning. My next opportunity was in 1988 when I led the closure of Philadelphia State Hospital. For this closure, we chose to focus on community integration, moving people into independent housing with strong support, not to another institution. By the time the hospital closed two years later, we had learned some very important lessons about helping people live in the community. Housing, the lessons learned. Housing was the single most important factor in closing or downsizing an institution. We learned that choice changes over time. In fact, choice fluctuated several times in the course of the year. This meant People often started off with the idea of I wanted to live independently, I want to live alone, and then got into an independent apartment and said, oh, I think I want a roommate. We found a roommate of their choice, and they um, lived maybe for another six weeks and decided mm, maybe alone was better. Um, the key, of course, was flexibility and having choices. We all changed our mind, and people coming from institutions with limited experience had the same rights. Supports are what makes housing work and create a successful outcome. And intensive support was what was needed to help people who were returning to the community. Supports meant often did mean a case manager. It meant social outlets, not just nine to five during the week. It meant having friends. It meant things to do, work, hobbies, activities. It meant faith activities if desired. It meant secure financial benefits, and it meant staying in contact with health providers. So all of the supports had to work together to keep housing independent. And finally, the one, one of the very strong things we learned was the importance of community voice. In the closure, we talked with lots of different people, hospital workers, community staff, families, independent psychiatrists, and consumers. The most consistent voice that lasted throughout any kind of discussion was that of the consumer himself or herself. Listening was the key skill. Housing, we also learned, needed to be independent of other factors. For example, it was not acceptable to put conditions on housing. In other words, you could not just stay in housing if you attended a day program. 
people needed to know their housing was secure regardless of other things going through, going happening. Another key factor that we learned from the closure was to focus on the two populations impacted by a closure. The first population was easy, the people in the hospital. They were a known group and we could talk and prepare. The second group was a greater challenge, the people who would have gone to the hospital had it been open. They too needed the commitment of housing choice, supported and independent with support. 30 years later, the community support team that was created for the closure continues to support many of those who left the hospital in 1990. This was nine years before um, their decision. My next, my next opportunity to impact community integration was in 2003 as Secretary of Human Services in Pennsylvania, then known as Public Welfare. We closed several institutions, state mental hospitals, mental retardation centers, plus downsized nursing facilities. At this point, the Onstead decision had been in effect for a few years, but only pockets of integrated housing existed. We had learned by then the concept of community choice housing applied to more than state institutions. Individuals might be in any type of institution. They might be experiencing homelessness, they might be leaving a jail or prison. They may be in congregate housing and not want to be there. However, what they all wanted was to live more independently with friends of their choice. And we began to see the broad impact that Omset could have when you look to talk to people about their choices. Using the legal support of Omset helped, but too many people didn't understand the purpose. Using a combination of managed care and Medicaid, Pennsylvania was able to expand supportive housing, expand permanent housing, and help people have choices in their type of housing. Housing finance agencies were key to policy changes and to a general market. Again, lessons learned. Housing was still the most important critical factor in helping people live in the community. Housing needs to be independent continually, and it was not acceptable to put conditions on housing. Medicaid and Medicaid through managed care could be an important player and a financer. Partnerships with housing finance and public housing had to be created and nurtured. State leadership was essential, and the voice of the consumer or person with lived experience was necessary to be, um, to be successful. As my tenure in Pennsylvania was coming to an end, my choice of employment pointed me towards housing, but to be exact. I needed to know more about how to get affordable housing and the mental health system working together in an integrated manner. We knew by this point that housing um, was bricks and mortar, but it also meant choice. We knew the mental health system believed in choice, but didn't have a great deal of experience in building housing. We also knew that housing um, needed, to, the housing people and the mental health people needed to come together to work together and not do each other's jobs. By the time I got to HUD, very few people knew about Onstead and did not understand the mandate of having people with disabilities live in the community. Their mindset was to group people together. Let's put all the people that had needs in a one group in one housing and call it disability housing. Nice idea, but did not work. And the education process was to teach people that integrated housing was based on choice and who you wanted to live with. The mindset then was if it had 50% people without disabilities, it was integrated housing. With the help of the HUD legal office, we were able to educate staff about Olmstead and its meaning. Choice became the operative word. Scattered housing became the new term, and we tried to get the percentages down to less than 20%. HUD did support housing choice. The use of vouchers to support choice and the importance of working with Medicaid and mental health as partners. Again, many lessons learned. First, we must educate all staff at every opportunity about Olmstead at the federal, state, and local level. 
partnerships between mental health entities, Medicaid, managed care, housing finance, and public housing are all necessary. They're all players, and they do need to work together. The expectation was not to have housing people become mental health providers or mental health providers to become housers, but to learn to work together and to share the experiences. We also learned that elected officials and an appointed administrators also need education on Olmstead and needed examples on how they could be effective. We learned that supports were still critical to success, and the supports needed to be broader and broader and needed to help people in all facets of their life. The voice of people with lived experience is still critical. And listening and listening to them and having them participate in policy discussions helps all projects be successful. And finally, creative financial solutions were necessary. Being, finding ways to just have the mental health system fund housing was never going to produce enough or fast enough. Being able to learn about words such as leverage and how to work with banks and how to work with financial um, institutions to make sure that people had choice in housing became critical. And indeed, all of the other factors when supported were able to step up. Those relationships, while not new, still need nurturing and still need commitment. The challenge of Olmstead for the future is to assure housing folks mental health system people, Medicaid people all work together to assure housing, to assure people have housing choice and support to live comfortably in the community. My partners today will talk about state plans, how to create good ones, how to operationalize and implement plans. As Olmstead comes of age at 21, we have those adolescent years behind us. We know our strengths and weaknesses and we're ready to grow and mature. We know the struggle is not over, but our commitment to succeed is as strong as ever. Thank you. Kevin, I think you're thanks. next. Yep, thanks, Estelle. Uh, hi, everybody, this is Kevin Martone. And uh, you know, if for those of you who don't know Estelle or maybe you're newer to the field and haven't had the uh, opportunity or privilege to, to know or work with Estelle, uh, it really is an honor to have Estelle kick off a presentation like this. You know, her. She's been a really a, a visionary leader um, at the federal, state, and local level for many years on issues like this, and uh, it's great to have her on this webinar. So thank you, Estelle. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Olmstead planning. Um, part of this is built on my experience, um, really, um, through some of my work as commissioner in New Jersey on Olmstead plan development and implementation, as well as um, some of the work that we're doing um, at the Technical Assistance Collaborative, or TAC, uh, in states around the country. And really also just building off of some of my own um, professional work experiences, um, providing supportive housing and community integration services um, in the nonprofit world, you know, as well as a, as a family member and, and really sort of hoping to, to see a, a system develop that can really um, promote community integration for, for people with disabilities out there. Um, I think it's important to say that, you know, we're really looking at this, um, and I suspect most of the people on the call today are coming at this through a mental health or behavioral health background, but you know, when we're talking about Olmstead, generally we're talking about people with disabilities across the board, and I think that's something important, and that'll get teased out in the slide as we go forward. And, and we're also talking about, um, you know, planning uh, for, for adults uh, and children. Um, and so oftentimes, we're, you know, we focus on adults, but we also really need to consider how children with disabilities, whether they're serious and emotional disturbances or intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, are served in integrated settings, including in the classroom. And so I think those are all parts of the conversation as we go forward. So we're going to basically go over generally what is Olmstead, what does community integration mean, uh, how did the Supreme Court approach this. Uh, we're going to give some examples and some lessons learned uh, as, as we go through the presentation today. So. You know, as Jennifer had mentioned earlier today, today actually the 22nd is the actual anniversary, 21st anniversary of the Supreme Court's decision on Olmstead, and essentially that was an affirmation of um, the obligation for states to ensure that individuals with disabilities are able to live in the most integrated settings possible. And I think what's important to stress on this point is that's not just a concept; um, that's actually built in law, and, and there should be actions behind it. And and a lot of times, even today, 21 years later. 
you know, we'll hear folks talk about, you know, believing in the concept, right? Yes, people should have the ability to live in the most integrated settings possible. But then when you start to think about the complexities involved in that in terms of making housing available and services available, or even sometimes, you know, sort of hearing those thoughts still that, well, you know, yeah, I believe in the concept, but not all people can live in, in integrated settings. You know, we're still challenged with, um, you know, uh, those implementation, implementation issues 21 years later. So we have to keep in mind that this is, this is more than a concept. This is the real thing. Um, the regulations implementing Title II of the Americans with Disability Act define an integrated setting as one that enables individuals with disabilities to interact with non-disabled persons to the fullest extent possible. And that's an important point to consider as we're going forward in all of this, because, you know, as we try to move people from, let's say, institutional segregated settings into community-based settings, um, it doesn't just mean having folks then go to a day program with other people with disabilities like them, right? We have to really sort of push this in our planning um, to enable individuals to interact with non-disabled persons to the fullest extent possible. And I think these are two key themes to keep in mind as we go forward in the conversation. The next two slides, I'm kind of kind of break the uh, the, the PowerPoint principles. Um, they have a lot of wording on them, and I'm probably going to read a lot of them. But they are very important slides because they they, they frame a lot of the conversation um, and what planning you're going to be doing in your systems. And so um, the Department of Justice had come out with essentially a definition of what um, integrated settings are and what segregated settings are. And I think they're important to keep in mind. And so I'm going to sort of go through these and just bear with me for a minute. Um, but essentially, you know, um, as we talked about, uh, they offer access to community activities um, at times, frequencies, uh, with persons of an individual's choosing, uh, afford individuals choice in their daily life activities. So there's a lot of choice work in there. Um, and provide individuals with disabilities the opportunity to interact with non-disabled persons, uh, just as I had mentioned before. And it talks about evidence-based practices that provide scattered site housing with supportive services as examples of integrated settings. Um, that there may be other settings, right? That's just part of the definition. But I think the key theme is there is evidence-based practices um, as you're thinking through what type of settings uh, can support people in an in, in, in integrated setting. So when you go over to the next part of their definition, they talk about segregated settings. And the segregated settings, um, they generally defined as uh, congregate settings populated exclusively or primarily with people, uh, individuals with disabilities. Congregate settings characterized by regimentation and daily activities, lack of privacy or autonomy, policies limiting visitors, or limits on individuals' ability to engage freely in community activities and to manage their own activities of daily living. Or, settings that provide for daytime activities primarily with other individuals with disabilities. And if we pause there for a minute and we think about uh, the systems that we all work in across the country, uh, in every community in every state across the country, we can probably think of settings that fall into this segregated part of the definition here. And it's not necessarily intended to say, oh, my God, the, the, the Olmstead police are going to come running in here. Um, but it really should frame the conversation planning in your system when you're trying to think what kind of uh, system you're trying to build um, that, that moves away from segregated settings and more towards integrated settings. So keep that in the back of your mind as we're, as we're going forward. So in the Supreme Court's decision, uh, the Supreme Court had indicated that if, if a state had a comprehensive, effectively working plan for placing qualified persons with disabilities in less restrictive settings, and a waiting list that moved at a reasonable pace, not controlled by the state's endeavors to keep its institution fully populated, the reasonable modification standard would be met. Um, and so it, it sort of lays out the premise that if, if you, you really need to have a plan to comply with Olmstead and the ADA, and if you don't, you actually may be defenseless against potential litigation moving forward. Um, for an Olmstead plan to serve as a reasonable defense, uh, against legal action, it must include concrete and reliable commitments to expand integrated opportunities, and there must be funding to support the plan. And we'll tease a little bit more of that uh, out as we go forward. Um, the one thing I would say in here, when you think about what reasonable modifications are, um, there's a whole, a lot of different ways you can look at that um, as you go in, in, into your planning. 
But essentially, the, 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 the Supreme Court in the ADA challenged, you know, state systems to make those, quote, unquote, reasonable modifications to ensure integrated uh, living. And, you know, a quick example of that might be, you know, um, you, know you change a, a policy requirement. You know, maybe the requirement was, well, if you wanted to get access to supported housing, for instance, you had to be coming out of a hospital setting, which was sort of a fail-first policy, right? You went into the hospital, and that was the only way you became eligible for integrated housing. And maybe a policy change there might be a reasonable modification. A bigger reasonable modification might actually be repurposing um, of funds from high-cost segregated settings, like maybe state, hosp state psychiatric hospitals, to more integrated community-based settings. So there's just, those are just two quick examples. So Olmstead plans, in my mind, generally should include um, three core components. And I think it's more complex than this, but I think it's important to keep in mind. You should really think about a description of the state's current system of providing community-based services and supports to people with disabilities. What does your system look like? Uh, how is it currently structured? You really need to have those conversations and looking at your, your data and everything to sort of understand, you know, what that is the, as the basis for you uh, moving forward. Um, in that plan, you really should think about an assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of your system, right? What are the strengths of your system? You know, are you serving people in integrated settings? Are you using evidence-based practices and things like that? And what are your weaknesses? You know, do you have too many people in, in restrictive settings? Um, is your funding currently imbalanced in your system and geared more towards segregated settings? So you really need to have that, you know, what are your system strengths and weaknesses in your plan? And then really that third component is the description of the state's plan and goals for expanding opportunities for providing community-based services and supports to people within, the, within the, uh, people with disabilities. You know, what are you gonna, get, uh, gonna do? How are you gonna go about it? So when systems are going through their Olmstead planning, we sort of try to think about, well, when we talked about the definition before, what are the types of institutional segregated settings that we're talking about? And often in many of the systems, and you think about your system, you know, a range of these types of, of settings may exist. Um, state psychiatric hospitals or developmental centers, nursing facilities, uh, board and care facilities. And that looks different and it's may, maybe called something different in every state. In some places they're called adult homes or adult care homes. Some places they're called assisted living. Some places they're called residential care. Um, they could be congregate living programs. Um, a lot of times we're talking with systems now about um, incarceration and correctional settings um, as obviously institutional is segregated in nature. And then we also talk about um, and see states thinking about um, uh, settings that place people at risk of institutionalization. You know, so if you're homeless, um, you know, maybe because of lack of services or access to treatment or, you know, you're, you, you don't have access to affordable housing and you're homeless, um, you're probably at a very uh, high likelihood of institutionalization. Um, people at home with aging parents um, often are at risk of institutionalization um, and other substandard living conditions. So going a little bit further in terms of the, some, some examples of key Olmstead plan ingredients, um, you know, you want to take a look at the populations to be addressed, right? Um, when I was in New Jersey um, as a commissioner, you know, the approach that the state took at the time um, was sort of in a siloed approach. I'm not, I'm not recommending that as the best approach. I'm just saying it is what it was in New Jersey. You know, so there was an Olmstead plan that was geared towards adults with serious mental illness. There was another plan that was geared towards uh, individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, other states have taken a very broad-based approach and worked cross-disability, which tends to be the, the, uh, the trend right now and the way to go. Um, but, you know, you're going to want to talk about the, the, the populations that you're, you're seeking to address in your plan. You know, um, plans will have a data analysis in it. They'll specifically address things like housing and employment, uh, wellness and integrated health care, transportation. So it's not always about, you know, someone coming out of a state psychiatric hospital, for example. It's really a broad range of the types of um, system components that are addressed in, in an Olmstead plan. Um, you know, all of a sudden plans will talk about funding, you know, what's in place, what's needed. Um, they'll talk about policies, rules, and regulations. And this, you know, again, starts to get at the reasonable modification thing I mentioned a few minutes ago in terms of the types of rules or policies, for instance, that you may want to modify in a state to uh, strengthen your capacity to serve people in integrated settings. Um, plans really should 
address outcomes. Um, you know, what are you going to measure? What's working? What's not working? Um, if you don't know right now, how can you sort of go about establishing the types of data that you want to collect and the types of outcomes that uh, you want to measure going forward? Um, and plans will also even talk about training and workforce development activities. Um, this is really critical in many states, um, particularly even rural states where um, there's, there's such significant staffing shortages, yet Olmstead and the ADA still apply, and how can systems really um, uh, address their training and workforce uh, issues uh, so that they can support these efforts. Um, even today, um, in, you know, the COVID environment, you know, where staffing and the delivery of community-based services is, is greatly challenged, um, you know, you have to really consider how can we still make sure staff can be, av be available to support people in integrated community-based settings. Um, I think some things specifically on data analysis, um, you know, on the population served, you know, there's a whole different uh, bunch of ways to look at it. Um, in my experience, you know, many states are weak in this area um, and really need to develop those, um, those data measures or uh, data sharing agreements with other organizations in, able, in, in order to be able to do a good data analysis. But you're going to want to look at things like the type of disability, age, race, ethnicity. You know, for instance, you know, are there particular racial or ethnic groups that are uh, disparately served in segregated settings. You're going to want to know that. Um, are they underserved um, in integrated settings? You're going to want to know that. So you really should, you know, use that data to, to drive, you know, um, you know, based upon your populations and who you're serving and where. Uh, where is your funding allocated? How much of your funding goes to settings that may be considered segregated versus integrated? Is there an imbalance there? You know, where are people served? You know, are you having a uh, big boarding, um, uh, boarding issues in emergency departments or hospitals? Um, do you have a significant number of people who are served in segregated day programs? Um, where do people live? Are they in adult homes that may be considered segregated? Are they in supportive housing? You know, you're going to want to understand that data analysis. Um, you're going to want to understand reimbursement issues. You know, are rates working? Are rates significant enough to um, meet the needs of providers to serve people? And then, again, even the workforce shortage issues. So, you know, these are just a, a, a list of examples. They're not, not exhaustive. But, you know, your Olmstead planning really should be built on data analysis. And if your data systems are very weak, then one of the objectives in your Olmstead plan should be to develop those data systems to drive your Olmstead planning forward. This is something that we sort of think about at TAC when we're working with systems on Olmstead planning. And I think sort of at the outset, you know, Olmstead planning is not the outcome, right? Developing your Olmstead plan should not be the outcome. It's really part of a continuous cycle. And, you know, we sort of look at it as community integration being the center. And it's a cycle of uh, system analysis, the plan development, the implementation, and the performance measurement. It's, it's something that, you know, um, you know, it's not a plan that you put out for three years and then it's done. It's a plan that you put out for two, three, four years, and then you you revisit that plan periodically to keep things going as, as your systems evolve. So a couple of things that we've seen, this is my experience in New Jersey and, and certainly how we've seen some states um, approach this. There are different approaches to homestead planning, right? And these are sort of general buckets. You know, there are states who are doing nothing, right? And if I think about quotes that sort of go with these or quotes that I've actually, I've literally heard um, in working with states, you know, a quote that might go along with that is, you know, we put ourselves at risk if we have an Olmstead plan, uh, or there are too many other priorities. And so those states choose not to do an Olmstead plan. Um, planning with little action. You know, a quote that might go with that is, we have a plan, but we can't do anything about it because of the legislature. The legislature doesn't give us any funding to implement our plan. Um, there are states who are doing proactive planning. Um, even 21 years later, you know, there are states today who are doing proactive Olmstead planning. You know, and, and, and the quote that might go with that is Olmstead aligns across our policy, policy priority areas, right? The states are looking at it as, yeah, this is not necessarily an add-on. This is something that fits in with all the other things that we're trying to do. Uh, reactive planning. There are many states who are sort of reactively planning. And a quote, you know, a quote with that might be something like, we better, we better do an Olmstead plan because the PNA is sniffing around, right? So there's a little bit of fear you know, that um, there's something coming, so we better get out and do an Olmstead plan right now. Um, and then there are states who are actively involved in litigation and settlement agreements. And a quote with that might be something along the lines of, now we have to develop an Olmstead plan because of our settlement agreement. Or in some states, um, 
uh, because you lost an Olmstead, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, because you lost an Olmstead type court decision. You know, there are some states recently who have lost Olmstead type decisions, and that will sort of drive their Olmstead planning going forward. Um, significant recommendation, you know, when you're engaging in Olmstead planning, um, there should be stakeholder input. And states have gone about it differently. These are some examples of how they've pulled it in. Um, some states have created, you know, pretty high-level Olmstead advisory councils or subcommittees. Um, they look at things um, uh, using maybe existing groups um, that are statewide and regional. Um, many Olmstead planning efforts um, conduct stakeholder meetings or listening sessions. Um, some states have actually um, created mechanisms online for input and feedback through um, just, uh, you know, simply taking emails or surveys and things like that. Um, legislative involvement is, is always an important one. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, it, you know, if you're putting an Olmstead plan together and it requires changes in policy or rules and regulations or funding, um, legislate, legislators have to, have to be aware of that. Um, and, and I'll get into a little bit more of that in a couple minutes, but, you know, those are types of uh, examples of stakeholder input. So, you know, different states have different experiences and implementation issues, but, you know, sort of in my work in New Jersey, as well as, you know, some of this work in other states, these are general things that have, have popped up um, that I think are really relevant to folks out there. Um, successful Olmstead planning requires committed leadership, including from the governor's office, budget offices, and other state agencies, including the legislature. If you don't have that, Olmstead planning can be a real challenge. You've got to have that, that uh, leadership make that a priority and send that message throughout um, not only a Department of Human Services or a Department of Mental Health, but throughout all state agencies, because it really is a cross-agency uh, process. Planning and implementation usually requires the cross-agency involvement, right? So, you know, if so much, if, if a chunk of your Olmstead plan talks about transportation or housing, for instance, you know, that's, that's often outside or external to a Department of Mental Health. And so you really need to have those agencies at the table. And it can be a real challenge to get those agencies to the table, particularly if that directive is not given from higher up to say that this is an important issue across the board and, and, and different state agencies need to be at the table. Um, as I mentioned, the legislature has to be educated about Olmstead and the planning process. You know, I've seen systems where the, the legislature has um, authorized through law a state agency to engage in Olmstead planning. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, Olmstead planning requires some resources to implement and the legislature sort of, if they weren't really educated or aware of the process, you know, and now they're not going to really support it through, you know, changes in laws or funding, you've got a problem. Um, and, and, and Olmstead and community integration really does take new resources, whether those are new, coming through new authorizations, or repurposed or reallocated. Um, they really need to be put in there, and, and the legislature needs to be part of that process in many states, depending on how your state is structured. Um, you really need to think about inter uh, preparing internal staff. Um, what I've found over the years is not all staff are on board. Um, again, it goes, some of it goes back to the concept, yeah, I agree to have, you know, I agree that people should live in integrated settings, but, you know, so you need to do some internal prep work because at the end of the day, um, it does require, you know, uh, multiple staff from your state agencies to help implement Olmstead. Um, developing an inclusive planning process with stakeholders can be hard. Um, part of it is having hard conversations with stakeholders and being able to listen to the impact and input and feed, feedback that stakeholders give to you. Um, you know, stakeholders, consumers, family members, providers can really be passionate about the seats that they're coming from on the states that the, the, the things that states should be doing differently. Um, and we have to be open to that in the process. Uh, we have to anticipate and manage resistance. Um, resistance can come from all over the place when you're doing homestead planning because you're talking about really significant things. You're talking about moving people from um, settings to new settings or uh, taking things away or, you know, putting new things in, taking money from one, pot of, one type of provider and moving it to another provider. You know, there's lots of different types of resistance that you can experience, and you have to anticipate that, you know, from your you know, your colleagues, the governor's office, uh, right down the line, and, and, and figure out ways to, to plan to address it. 
And talking about Olmstead is not a good defense, uh, nor is a plan that sits on a shelf. And I think we probably all, you know, understand that. But a lot of times we'll see out there folks talking about Olmstead or saying we're doing Olmstead planning, but again, you know, where the rubber hits the road, you know, are the action steps in place, you know, that make that plan implementable, a plan that can move at a reasonable pace, or are we just talking about Olmstead? Because at the end of the day, if you have an Olmstead plan that doesn't have, you know, those nuts and bolts that can you know, implement the changes that are need to be made, you know, that plan um, is, is weak. Um, cautions. So just because it's in the community doesn't mean it's integrated. And we've seen this a lot out there, and you can imagine this in your systems, right? Well, you know, we move people out of the state, state psychiatric hospital or the nursing home into the community, um, so it's integrated. Well. You know, what we've found over the years is that many community-based settings um, may not be integrated. They may be segregated. And you have to really pay attention to that and sort of almost go back to the framing definition that DOJ had out about uh, integrated and segregated settings to, to sort of think through that concept. Choice may have different meanings to different people. Um, you know, if, if a uh, facility says, well, we gave, you know, John Doe the choice of four group homes to live in, is that really choice, you know, if John wanted to live in a supportive housing, uh, integrated supportive housing environment? We have to really think about what choice means in the system, and it's not really a choice of the same type of setting across the board. It's a choice of settings. Uh, a plan to plan is not a plan. Um, it sounds simple, but many plans that we've seen over the years are just plans that sort of kick the, kick the can down the road and, and, and say we're going to do additional planning. It's not really a plan. It doesn't really have actionable measurable things in there, and you have to keep that in mind. And budget cuts and bureaucracy do not trump civil rights. You know, when uh, there wasn't a year when I was in state government that we didn't run budget cut scenarios. When times were good, we were running budget cut scenarios. When times were bad, we were running budget cut scenarios. Um, and, and, and even today, when you think about what's going on with COVID and the economic impact that states are experiencing, we know there's budget cut scenarios that are being run right now. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, it is, it is law. Uh, people have the right to live in the most integrated settings possible, and states need to keep that in mind when they're, when they're going through, you know, the budget cut scenarios or the budget development processes to make sure that they're not cutting services or housing or services that are going to put people at increased risk of institutionalization. Takeaways. Um, an Olmstead plan is a system change document. Um, you know, this is really important. You know, again, it goes back to, you know, folks working in state government or local government are very, very busy. You've got a lot of things on your plate. Um, and adding something onto the list, like an Olmstead plan, you know, may be perceived as an add-on, uh, add-on, you know, piece of work. And it, you really need to think about it not only as a systems change document, but as something that really aligns with a lot of the priorities that your state agencies are, are generally trying to achieve anyway. You know, if you're trying to serve people, you know, better, get them more access to behavioral health treatment, get them better access to integrated health options, get them better access to affordable housing, those are things that are all consistent with Olmstead. And so it's really important to try to align your Olmstead planning efforts with your other policy priority areas that are going on and try to sort of push away from this is just another add-on, you know, to, to the workload that we don't want to deal with. Um, you're defenseless without an Olmstead plan. Um, it, you know, we still hear states um, who make the case that, you know, um, we're just going to hide under the radar um, and, you know, and, and we'll take our chances. You know, and what I've seen in states is, you know, maybe that's played out up into a point, but at some point it's going to come full circle. Um, some, of the play to, some of the states who've experienced Olmstead litigation, you know, or threats of Olmstead litigation were states that were, you know, somewhat sophisticated, but um, nevertheless didn't have an Olmstead plan and got tagged. Um, you know, so it is really important to, you know, to keep in mind that, you know, that argument just doesn't hold water. Um, Olmstead plans really should be comprehensive but realistic. Um, your plan really needs to be actionable and achievable. You know, you don't want to necessarily put out that we're going to, you know, we're going to solve homelessness tomorrow um, if you know that the legislature is not going to fund it. Um, and you need to really think about how can we, you know, develop a plan that moves at a reasonable pace, um, is actionable, um, but it's realistic. 
And plans must focus on expanding access to integrated settings, not segregated settings. And, and we've seen that pop up in states, you know. So when you're planning on moving people from a state hospital or a nursing home, you know, you should really think about how you can stand, those, stand up those integrated settings that people can transition to. Um, you know, moving someone from a, a very segregated uh, setting into another very segregated setting it really, it really is not com consistent with, uh, with Olmstead. Um, it's better to have a short, actionable plan than a 100- or 200-page document that just identifies the issues and barriers, why progress can't be made. You know, we've seen that a lot where a state may put a plan together, and then it says, you know, but we have no money or the legislature won't fund this and things like that. So, you know, try to have that short, actionable plan. Um, the plan should be developed with stakeholder involvement, as, as I'd indicated before. I think that's really critical. Um, not only do the stakeholders have a really good um, perspective on things that could be done in the system, um, but it also really helps you with buy-in, you know, particularly if you're trying to make really big, significant changes, you know, where maybe there's one group that comes out and says, you know, well, we do not support this, you know, but um, if you have really good stakeholder involvement um, and they, they feel valued and, like, they've had a genuine um, involvement in the process, they can really help your cause and carry the message. Um, plants should have short and long-term goals and a plan to track and report on progress. Um, you have to continue to track and report on progress. When that, when that um, plan gets shelved, um, you know, it's dead in the water. It really is. So with that, I'm going to take a pause, and I'm going to let, uh, turn it over to Harvey Rosenthal and let him talk about his experience with New York State's planning. Harvey, you may be on mute. I think I am. How's that? Can you hear me okay? Yep, got you. Good. Yes. Yes. Great. Hi, everybody. Listen, um, it's really a great pleasure to be on this presentation with a legend like Estelle and a hero like, like Jennifer and a friend and a really brilliant um, advocate and uh, implementer in terms of Kevin. So I'm really delighted to be here. I just want to make a left turn and say that the COVID crisis has really called the question about Olmstead because there are people who are, because of the spread in institutions, whether it be jails, prisons, adult homes, hospitals, has raised the question, uh, who needs to be, you know, who should be there in a time of, of, of this kind of contagion, or better yet, who, who shouldn't be there? and who ought to be discharged. And that's the question that's come up in New York and I'm sure in other places. And there have been some efforts to move people out who really should have been out anyway. So uh, the COVID question really called the question around uh, the number of people that are there who don't need to be. And there's been some attention to that, I think. One thing that wasn't in my bio is the part that says that it's personal to me. I'm a person in recovery. Um, I began my career in a mental hospital in 1970. I began working in a hospital in 1975 up in Albany, and I've been an advocate since 1995. And a big focus has been on rights and recovery and choice, community integration, uh, employment, housing, peer support, et cetera, uh, self-directed care, um, and, and such. Um, but our mission really at Niapras has been to raise the bar, certainly from where it was back in the, in the 90s, to uh, that the system that people are, are capable of so much more than what was assumed and assigned and what the system was such a dumbing down um, and so raising the bar for making it clear what's possible for people and raising the bar for what government and proviso ought to be doing has been a, a real focus um, i'm going to make another left turn which is i tend to do when i've been a member of the misc which is new york's body for some time and in the beginning of our look at this, I'm thinking of what Kevin said, there was one state, maybe I shouldn't say who, that really had an Olmstead plan that was comprehensive and, and detailed. Here's a goal. Here's how you quantify it. Here's what law changes needed to be. Here's what dollar amounts ought to be and a timeline for that. I don't think I've ever, I don't know how well implemented it was, but to me it was the gold standard because it took into account all the issues, measurable and fundable, supportable. Um, and backed by law. So I just want to put that out. Um, so um, I began, let me try to move some slides here too. 
I really uh, was appointed to the New York's body. We have an Olmsted body in New York. I heard about that, actually. I was advocating for it, but I was, we had had a scandal where uh, people in adult homes with mental health, uh, mental health related issues, it was clear that they were being abused and neglected, and it was the subject of a New York Times article, and there was all kind of advocacy happening about it, and I was at a meeting uh, working with the health department on that and got the call from my friends in the Cross Disability Coalition that they had stormed the Capitol and had you know, forced the government to pass a law that Im uh, implemented a most integrated setting coordinating council in 2002. And the way ours is structured is that it's, not, it's state agency representatives and nine public members, and I'll explain that in a minute. It's intended to meet on a quarterly basis, as in always, and it's supposed to promote access to increased housing, employment, and particularly on trans transportation. These are the agencies that were deemed by law to, to have a stake into what it takes to help the state uh, meet the Olmstead standards. So you'll see agencies for people with developmental disabilities, mental health, aging, health department, alcohol and substance use, housing, transportation, children and family, and the Justice Center and, and such. Uh, there are three consumers of services for individuals with disabilities. I've been one of those uh, since 2002. Uh, there are three individuals with expertise in the field of community services and three individuals with expertise or recipients of services. I have to tell you that mo I, I can't tell you a time where all nine seats were filled. So, and that's important. They really should be filled. Uh, the committee was formed and our original work related, we were in an administration that wasn't really focused on Olmsted, was not really, had a real commitment. So we had some pro forma sort of meetings and we broke down into the right kinds of groups, housing and employment and transportation, and we met on a quarterly basis. And I'll tell you that as an advocate, cutting through all the bureaucracy, I would just keep saying, this is about jobs, apartments, and a bus or a car. This is about being able to get around town, live independently, and hopefully get a job. Everything else is, is you know, is, is government sort of talk. What are we doing to accomplish those goals? And you can keep saying that for years in these meetings, and it's very hard to make that the, the achievable focus. We had some non mis I want to sort of track a side theme I have here, which is a lot of things happen outside of the Olmstead plan. We had a federal pilot called New York Works, which is really wonderful, and it allowed peace, tested what happened if you allowed people with disabilities to keep their SSI and Section 8 payments, and would they, you know, stay on the job and thrive? And the answer was yes, but the, the money ran out. In 2003, uh, the advocates came together as a wonderful sort of coalition between people with, with mental health disabilities, people with physical disabilities, and people with AIDS, HIV, and we made a big push to get New York to be one of the states it had not been to allow people to keep their Medicaid and go back to work. And a couple of us actually got arrested at that time outside the governor's office in an effort to make that happen. Uh, and so that was the big, that showed a lot of promise in that that's one of the reasons people, people don't go to work is they're afraid to lose their health care. And the campaign was called Work and Wellness Now. And then several years later, we were able to grant from the federal government that really brought a lot of money into New York to really um, to a lot of training and education with providers, families, and the community around the importance of employment. All that happened outside of the Olmstead plan. And here's some examples of what the, one of those one of those funded initiatives through, through the Medicaid infrastructure grant. They were plentiful at the time. I think the money ran out, but states like New York use the money to as you can tell, work with providers, work with employers, uh, try to move, really set the tone for moving out of sheltered workshops to competitive employment and encouraging entrepreneurship. Again, lots of money, some activity. Truth of it is that when I began this work, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities was 70%, and for people with mental health disabilities was 85 And I have to confess, it's not much different now despite everything I'm going to tell you. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. Uh, the Coleman administration came in, and they were much more fo focused on this. They uh, formed a cabinet. They formed an Olmsted implementation plan. 
with recommendations. They put up a website. They actually brought over an Olmstead sort of officer uh, in the administration. They immediately made a settlement. I mentioned that issue with the adult homes, where the adult home residents had been uh, maintained there in these institutions for decades. And finally, a lawsuit that the Avalon Center was a part of uh, reached a settlement. But I'll tell you, you know, there's a part of me that used to say laws are good, but lawsuits are even better. But even laws and lawsuits are not, are, are, you know, are not enough. And even in these stories, we're still waiting for people to be able to leave the adult homes in any measurable way, despite all these years. Uh, so again, one subset for you for an advocate is you just can't stop. You can't assume any of this is going to work. There's always going to be a reason why it can't be funded. It's, you know, it's no longer of interest. It's in somebody's district. There are lobbyists for the other team who represent, you know, people who run jails, prisons, adult homes, who are slicker and, and sort of gum things up. So it really just requires an eye on the price sort of, rel of relentlessness. Back to the Cuomo administration, they developed an employment first executive order. That perhaps is the most impressive thing. And they're just uh, putting on board a chief, uh, chief disability officer we may hear about next week. And that'll be somebody in the cabinet who actually will oversee Olmstead. And that's good because the oversight of the Olmstead body, the MISC, Most Integrated Standing Coordinating Council, I may have not been clear about that, which was passed by that law I mentioned. Um, it was being sponsored by, by agency leads, whether it's an uh, office of, for people with, with, dis with normal disabilities or mental health disabilities. And in the end, they all report to the governor's office, and the governor's office is what really counts. So to have someone in the governor's office who's going to be overseeing that is, is more encouraging. The recommendations of the cabinet are not rocket science, right? Provide access to housing, provide employment services that are not degrading, provide access to transportation services, work with aging services to avoid needless nursing home placements, coordinate children's services. These are not brilliant. You know, you have these work groups, and they come out with these recommendations, and they're not all that different. And again, the question is, what's the timeline? How is it going to get paid for? What are the mechanics? And frankly, how do you deal with the resistance at, you know, it, it, you know, that's inevitable. The goal, at least in the employment, uh, employment first initiative in New York, was to increase the employment rate of people with disabilities by 5%, decrease their poverty rate by 5%, and register as little as 100 businesses in having formal policies. We had some action on that. There was some momentum on that. But frankly, it got forestalled uh, while, we're, while the position was open. It was overseeing the Olmstead body, and things really honestly deteriorated for a while. And even though we're supposed to meet on a quarterly basis, that, that hadn't happened. It's about to start again on Monday, and I have more hopes about that. Uh, so the focus was going to be to come create employment-first service sort of culture. There has been work on that. There's been training, and there's been some resources put into that. But like all things, it's a work in progress. We had a major, and still have a major ticket to work program that incentivizes providers, particular for helping people get back to work. Limited success, important, but you know, uh, not the gold standard by itself. Medicaid buy-in enrollment, it's increased. It's very important when you're advocating in these states to get really actual numbers. What was the buy-in enrollment rate in June? What is it in August? You know, what's it going to be in December? Otherwise, we're just repeating the same reports about what's supposed to happen and what's going to happen. And there was some more attention that was given to uh, Access VR, uh, self-employment initiatives. Back to the adult home settlement that I mentioned, that is sort of the bookend here. It, it begins really in 2002. Here we are in 2020. We've had legal settlements. We'd have funding initiatives. We'd have endless meetings between the lawyers and the judge and the state. And there always seems to be any number of reasons why the residents don't move from uh, some sort of complexity of process, health homes and care managers, and too many workers involved and too many assessments. The residents lose hope, or they don't get the kind of individualized support. We were able to work to get a $5 million allocation to fund some adult home peer bridger programs peers going into the homes. We have some hope for that, but it's early in the game. 
And again, a lot of the residents are sort of beaten down now, and we're almost starting from scratch. So even when the laws are lined up and the money might be there, you still have to deal with the fact that people's, people's motivation may have deteriorated having been in an institution for so long. So then the work comes back to re-motivation, hopefully with a peer bridger. Uh, you know, I was going to, I would say there's a couple of real factors in what makes Olmsted happen. One of them is, and I don't have it on these slides, one of them is, is, is service reform. If you have old models like workshops and large institutions, uh, both on campuses of state hospitals and in the community, those models, you know, really define institutionalization one way or the other. So if you develop other models like you know, integrated employment and supported housing and uh, independent housing. That's certainly, you know, the program design development is really important. But then then really comes down the, you know, the number one thing, which is money. Who's going to pay for that? How much is it going to be? What's going to sustain it? How do you make sure it actually meets the outcomes? Or does it get subsumed into one more, you know, one more chronic sort of program? One of the hopes for that would be when you tie the money to outcomes, and in a value-based payment world where we're supposed to be paying now with Medicaid for outcomes, then you would think that would really get it done because you could measure how many people have apartments, how many people have jobs, how many people have cars. I'm here to tell you that the re and I'm, I don't want to offend the researchers out there, but researchers make it impossible, impossible to measure this. I sit in meetings all the time, and we can't even agree on what the definition of housing is because it might be different in different settings. Even though you could be on the street homeless, now you're in an apartment, you would think that defines housing. It has to be validated. It's taking years to come up with that. But you need outcome measures that are validated that are tied to financial reimbursement. Now we're in a managed care environment. When we went to the managed care environment, they said, well, the focus is on, going to be on keeping people out of jails and prisons and hospitals and emergency rooms, so you would think the money was going to go to independent housing and jobs. And the Medicaid director at the time said, this is going to be a real first, that health plans are going to be told. You have to get people jobs, not just you know appointments with doctors and pills. Didn't happen. The politics are really difficult, but at least we, we, move, you know, we, we move the ball a long way, but can I tell you that lots more people are living independently? Well, we have 40,000 beds that are paid for with the Office of Mental Health. Those are some form of supported beds, but we have you know hundreds of thousands of people who really also want to be given beyond those options into apartments. A lot of it has to do with political will. It has to do with program design. It has to do with the provider training. But to me, ultimately, you know, it's money that drives what happens, and the money now really tied to outcomes. So any Olmsted plan, going back to where I started, really the perfect plan would say, here's the goal for what population, here's how you're going to define it, here's a timeline, here's a law that has to be changed, here's a dollar amount that has to be you know, allocated. Absent of that, you can spin your wheels and just keep having these meetings and come up with nicer versions of this uh, of, of this phrase here. Um, criminal justice is a huge issue. Right now, it's just an extraordinarily painful issue. And, is, and no question in New York and most places, the, the increase, the preponderance of people with color, particularly African Americans in New York State jails and prisons is ungodly. And even when the COVID sort of came in, it was very hard to get people who were, really, who were imprisoned on small drug charges and who really who really should have been discharged you know you know a, a while ago quite a while ago what we work on in a criminal justice system it's not clear I know I was on a body that that Kevin convened looking at the link between Olmstead and getting people out of jails and prisons I'm not sure that it, we have a you know rock solid sort of uh, line that you can draw but what we work on from a programmatic point of view and again this has nothing to do with the Olmsted body and one of my takeaways is a lot is going to happen outside of the Olmsted body which can often be sort of a showpiece uh, but what's happening uh, criminal justice is we're working hard to as you would think with the police and in New York City after years of backing crisis intervention teams and retraining police 
to de-escalate situations, the advocates gave up last week and said, we no longer believe in training police. We believe in replacing them as first responders. And as a result, we, we are want an initiative to reprogram the money from the New York Police Department and hire peers and EMTs, emergency medical techs, and let them be the first responders. Got to stop somewhere. So if we can do good to sort of diversion, that's critical. People in jails and prisons, we worked some years ago, Baslan was part of that, to put, you know, to put a, some kind of a limit on the use of solitary confinement. We didn't go far enough. We couldn't get far enough, even with a lawsuit and a law. But now we're working at it again with an extraordinary sort of coalition to try to, on this bill called the HALT bill, try to ban solitary confinement for, with a number of groups, including pe people with, uh, with, with psychiatric disabilities and, and other disabilities. We're having trouble uh, really getting it through, uh, we're, and we're having trouble with, with the governor, uh, who's somewhat supportive but not really willing to make the commitment. Again, to do that, you have to take on the resistance, which in many cases, in this case, is the, is, is the unions for the, uh, for the correction officers. So I guess I'm just trying to tell you to make these words and these principles really happen. A lot of it has to do with changing the incentives, changing the political will, building sort of coalitions that operate well outside of these MISC meetings. We have the meetings, people show up and they testify, people listen, they write it down. The next meeting is a replication of the same conversation. Not a lot of outcomes. If you're going to have an Olmstead plan, meeting to meeting, how many were on the Medicaid buy-in? How many were able to keep their Medicaid and go back to work? In June, how many now? What's the holdup? Okay, the social service departments aren't educating. Consumers don't know about it. Providers don't know about it. Not rocket science. Problems can be solved. Has to be the political will. So again, in a most integrated setting coordinating council, there should be these kinds of measurable strategies that have a chance at working. And there's the will to keep asking about them time to time to time. Let me see if I have anything more here. So these are the takeaways, and here it is. It's relentless advocacy across administrations. No one administration, you know, is going to get it all done. And certainly the first administration we worked with was, was not at all interested. And this one, as progressive as they are, have to be pressed all the time. Uh, a lot of things are going to happen outside of the process, and the process is almost more of a, of a measure and almost a bully pulpit than it is something that has more, uh, more steam with it. Um, I think we've had a unique focus. I think we've made progress on employment, not so much measurable, but I think there's a general institutional in the best way understanding that people can and should work and that our program models must change to support that and allow that to happen. Um, I guess I'm just going to end on self-directed care, which I learned about from the Bazelon Center. By the way, I'm a happy board member of the Bazelon Center, if you haven't guessed. Self-directed mm -hmm. care is a profound change, and if you don't have it in your states, really consider it. And the short of strategic sort of purchases that go well beyond programs and uh, MISC bodies and conferences to the most sort of direct way. What is stopping you? Can we find a legitimate way to buy those things for you that's approval that will make really concrete steps and change lives? So I guess the sum total is the Olmstead plan is important, but I guess as I'm ending where I began, it's not as important as it is the sustained action and advocacy by, by groups of advocates that are, keep their eyes on the prize of jobs, housing, transportation, and find all and any means to fund that and to support that and to keep the focus on that. That's me. Great. Thank you, Harvey. Um, so I'm going to, uh, we have some really great questions that have come in. Um, I'm going to go through some of those questions, as many as we have time for. Um, but I want to highlight a few of them. Um, that I think uh, it's really particularly important to get to. Um, one of those is from Eddie Sissons. Um, says, how does Olmstead address individuals who cycle between homelessness, jail, and hospitals? And Harvey, that's something that you touched on a little bit, but um, 
I want to open that one uh, up to all three of the presenters and um, give them a chance to respond to that. Harvey, do you want to take a stab at it first? Or? I can take a crack at it. I mean, I was at your meeting, Kevin, and I remember you really tried to make the connection between the law, Homestead law, and that I know, as a matter of fact, in that meeting, there was there were people there that were pressing suits in other states, but mainly around people in hospitals, not so much in jails and prisons. Um, but I really think, in the end, um, it's about uh, it's about diversion, it's about rehabilitation, and not not torture, and you know, and a system that's focused on punishment and not rehabilitation. And then a reentry plan. There are there are you know there are waivers that are available that states could apply for to start Medicaid 30 days earlier, so people leave with on Medicaid already and with the support. So I would say, uh, to me, it's the continuum of let's let's avoid any arrest that's possible or any violence, tragedy, or murder. If people get in the jail and prison, let's make sure they're getting rehabilitation. And sometimes you have to get a lawsuit for that. Jennifer knows about that, to require the treatment and the rehabilitation. And then have a discharge plan where people leave and they don't come back. That's been our focus. Uh, I don't know that there's a direct uh, so connection with Olmstead, nor has it hasn't been brought up, and I haven't seen the connection. But 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 maybe Kevin, you would know more about that. Let me try that one, too. The, the, I'm not sure there is a di direct connection between Olmstead, homelessness, and jails, but the, the, because Olmstead is, is focused on, on community living and housing to a degree. But it does speak to um, support systems, um, and, um, and it speaks very much to how states handle support. Do we, for people who have mental illness or substance abuse, um, there should be some, I, I don't want to use the word case management, but in, in reality, what kind of supports do we give people to help them stay in the community? And if all we're doing is providing a house, then it's not going to work. Supports, housing supports are very much tied to who's giving that support. Um, and these are people who need help. Now, and it doesn't have to be in a kind of living. It can be independent living with a lot of support. Many of the Medicaid system waivers provide that kind of support. Now, I do have to say, in Pennsylvania, I think that we had 17 Medicaid waivers. We had waivers on waivers, practically. Um, but that takes political will. When you're looking for ways, when you're presenting things to, the, to, to CMS about how can you do something better. Um, and why makes a difference. Yeah, I would, just, I would just add, you know, when you're going through your planning, what is your data telling you, uh, you know, on, on why people are cycling? Um, you know, and that's going to look different in every, in every system. You know, I mean, maybe it's because, um, you know, a person may not have great access to a service out there, treatment or service, and if they experience crisis, you know, the, the only way to access treatment or services or crisis is by calling 911, and then you sort of, you know, that turns into an issue, you know. So I think it really depends on sort of what, what, what your data is telling you. I think we would, I would sort of suggest that as you're looking at your data, and maybe your data is sort of leading you in the direction of why people are cycling, that's then where you um, begin to try to make your intervention through an Olmstead plan to try to divert people, you know, to, you know, not only an integrated setting, but you know, divert them to the types of treatment or services that can help them succeed in the community. Jennifer? Thank, thank you, Kevin. Um, another question is from Tina Minkowitz. Um, this is about sort of services versus um, other aspects of integration, um, such as autonomy. So Tina's got two questions here um, which are related. Number one is, do you consider respect for personal autonomy by staff, including respect for privacy and non-coercion, a criterion for assessing compliance with community integration mandate? And the second part of that is, 
this is all focused on kinds of service delivery. Does the community integration mandate say anything about individuals who have been institutionalized or at risk of institutionalization and do not want to use services? So that's another one that I want to give all three of our presenters a chance to uh, address because I think it's important. Hey, it's Kevin. I could I could start. Yeah, um, you know, uh, as to the first question, I think, you know, if I mean, if a person's living in a setting um, and it's, it, it's got a lot of staff, su staff supervision and, you know, either by practice or, you know, policy and, and regulation within that setting that, you know, residents are required to do X, Y, and Z and, and staff are, you know, um, directing them to do X, Y, and Z, and if they don't, then they are, could be thrown out of their, you know, the place that they're living. You know, I think, you know, in your Olmstead planning process, you're going to sort of want to look at those settings to understand that, right? I think, you know, to the extent possible, you know, we want to talk about choice and privacy and non-coercion and things like that as, um, you know, um, being consistent with the principles of Olmstead. I don't know that if you have um, you know, one residence in a system that has staff who are covert, coercive and threatening to throw individuals out of a residential program, that that means the Department of Justice is going to come in and, and sue the state. But you're going to want to look at, by practice, what does it look like in your system? And you know, if we use residential settings as, the, as the, the topic here, you know, are your residential settings ones that are based on choice and individual choice and not based on coercion and things like that? And that sort of leads you in the direction of Olmstead. Um, you know, in terms of um, community integration mandate um, about uh, folks who don't want to use services, I think, again, a lot of the conversation we're talking about is choice, right? We, wanna, we want, you know, in many respects, a lot of times the supportive housing models we're talking about, um, you know, are built upon even a housing first um, type of approach where, you know, you're thinking about the individual's right to have an integrated place to live in the community and the right to refuse services. Um, and so, you know, systems will often strive for that. You know, there may be other individuals in a system who may may want or choose a different type of setting, but, you know, um, I think, uh, you know, obviously we want, if, if, if someone, if, if we believe that a person is in need of services, we want them to have access to services, but, you know, Olmstead, I think, will generally look at it as people have the right to choose or refuse services. So? Um, I think that's a, a, um, a good summary of the statement. I, I was um, just going to add that we had a very um, focused case management system when people came out of the state hospital using a community, community treatment team. And indeed, I think that they, at times, um, didn't respect personal autonomy, and they had to be pulled back. But they, they were determined not to, to make sure no one got lost um, and no one went without service, so they followed people pretty closely. I, I think, though, that as you give consumers more voice and you listen, not just giving a voice, but listen to it, you can control for that personal autonomy. It really is important, and people need to feel um, comfortable but I, I think that it's a, a matter of often listening. And I think both Kevin and Harvey have mentioned several times the importance to listen, listening to people with, um, with experiences and learned experiences and self-experience in our system. And when we really listen to them, then we can make sure that things like personal autom autonomy stay intact, even if the choice is, I don't want what you're offering. Um, and people have that right, you know. I, I, I've often had, um, had conversations with some advocates who say, you have to make sure people are always safe. Well, and, and indeed, that's one of the things you always want to do, but you also have to respect personal choice. And personal choice isn't always agreeing with those of us who may be the policy planners. It's also listening. And Harvey, do you have anything to add, or uh, if not, we'll go into the next I'll, question. I'll pick up on Tina's point. Um, does the mandate say anything about individuals have been institutionalized or at risk of institutionalization and do not want to use services? I don't know that the – I've not seen the Olmstead mandate address that. We have seen, as you know, 
Um, many states have, have been in trying to employ a forced outpatient treatment approach to, you know, who, who believe there are people at the risk and don't want to use services. Um, the most encouraging thing I see there is that there are models. We have one in Westchester County that is um, about helping people not get on, on, on court orders and not stay on court orders but to support people based on their own uh, uh, self-defined needs. So there are, I don't know if it has to do with an Olmstead mandate as much as it has to do with a systemic response to what do you offer, if anything, to people who simply don't want the services that are out there. Yeah, and I, I would just, so I'll add as the um, sort of moderator and um, you know, not one of the presenters, I don't want to take away from the presenters, but I, I, I would say that we, we have certainly had as part of our Olmstead claims and Olmstead settlements um, that sort of piece of choice being part of, um, you know, an aspect of community integration. And so, for example, like, you know, Kevin mentioned Housing First and uh, the ability to um, say, I, you know, I don't want to have the services um, sort of tied to the housing. And, and I think that is a piece of uh, community integration that's been built into um, to Olmstead. Um, so I want to move on to a question from Martha. Um, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, it's more of a pony, but um, she asked a question about the current pandemic, and again, I was touched on this a little bit during the, um, the webinar, but um, this kind of puts it out there. Clearly, during the current pandemic, the lack of adherence to Olmstead has been evident and resulted in huge rates of transmission and deaths in state facilities. Uh, we have seen people, and I would say it's not just state facilities, but private facilities too. Uh, we've seen people determined ready for discharge, kept in the hospital because of COVID-19. Is this being addressed? And I think that's an important question, sort of, you know, how um, in light of the challenges that have been presented by COVID-19, how are we um, doing in getting people out of uh, facilities that in many cases have now become dangerous um, uh, in terms of transmission? And you know, what are some of the strategies that folks are, um, are using to be able to ensure that Olmstead implementation can continue in this environment? And, um, this is another one um, I think all three of the folks um, can can answer. I'll just say really quickly, I know that there was a plan to um, move people from the adult homes into ho ho hotels. We have a lot of open hotels with the lack of uh, business. I'm not clear, and Jennifer, you might actually be clear as to whether that actually took place, but that was on the table for how to get people out of a home that was where the virus was rampant. I think in the prisons, I've actually seen, I've seen releases. Uh, I don't know the amount of it, but I know that there have been some uh, discharges of people that they deemed did need to be there and certainly shouldn't be at this time. I don't have data, though, or anything more specific than that. Yeah, it's, Kevin, it's a really, really important issue, um, and it, it is varied across states, at least from some of the, uh, at least some of the anecdotal information we've gotten. Um, let me say first, you know, from an Olmstead planning perspective, I know there's at least one state right now that is continuing to proactively do its Olmstead planning during COVID, and they're doing virtual stakeholder sessions and things like that. So you know, that's sort of just a point to keep in mind. Um, you know, but it, on, on the, the actual, you know, service delivery side, it, it is a challenge. Um, there have been some systems where it, it has totally shut down. Um, there's been other systems where, you know, the directive has come from the state agency that, you know, transitions really need to continue to occur. Um, you know, in, in some of the shared living types of programs out there, let's say a small group home or something like that, you know, um, they've decreased, um, quote, unquote, bed capacity. Um, to have people in single rooms versus shared rooms, um, you know, in order to um, minimize the, the potential spread. Um, for folks who are, you know, wanting to go from a, uh, an institutional setting to an apartment type of setting, it has been a challenge. Um, but, you know, there are some systems and provider groups who are definitely using telehealth um, as, a, as a method to not only work with uh, the state hospital or nursing home staff, but also to even 
screen, screen apartments uh, with landlords um, and do a lot of the transition planning, um, you know, for and with the individual. Um, you know, in some settings where visitors not allowed, um, providers are coming in and maybe sort of getting to the, the front lobby area um, and meeting a person, you know, there versus going on to the units. And so, you know, um, there are places that have developed strategies to, to um, continue to facilitate transitions, you know, um, but no doubt it's slowed up. You know, and, you know, and frankly, um, you know, of concern have been some federal policies that have um, facilitated uh, admission to facilities from nursing homes, for instance, which then all of a sudden it somewhat backfired because nursing homes tended to be a hotbed of, um, of contagion. So, you know, I think hopefully, you know, we're all living through this now. Hopefully we can try to make some continued progress with federal policies, but also at the state level with providers and, and facilities, um, you know, trying to sort of get past that perception, which was initially out there. I think it's there less now. But, you know, well, people are safer in the facilities right now than they are out in the apartments, and we've seen the data that sort of shows the, maybe the opposite of that. So, uh, and then a lot of it sometimes boils down to, you know, are providers getting access to PPE, you know, so that they can see people, you know, and help them transition from the facilities. And that's pro that, that is improving, um, but initially out of the gates it was a big problem because many of the providers didn't even have access to PPE. And so a lot of their teams, like their sort of community treatment teams or things like that, um, their ability to facilitate these transitions was challenged. Jennifer? Great. Okay, thank you. Um, so one of the other questions, um, I, anyone can take this. I don't think everybody needs to answer, but how does uh, Olmstead apply in forensic psychiatric settings, for example, state psychiatric hospitals, which these days often primarily serve uh, folks who are there under forensic commitments. Um, does somebody want to take that one? Yeah, it, you know, it, it, it's an added layer, right, because oftentimes when you have a person who's forensically involved, the court is involved, and a lot of times the court has some jurisdiction over that person's discharge or transition to the community. Um, you know, but that said, you know, when things, let's say, come together and clinically the person is ready to go and the court says, okay, that person's ready to go and that planning comes together, um, the person should be supported in a transition to an integrated setting. And I think where Olmstead applies, at least sort of on this specific part of it, is, you know, once those decisions are made, then that person should have the opportunity to move into, the, into an integrated setting. And sometimes what we see happen is, right, um, those decisions will be made, but then the person will still sit in the hospital, for instance, for another six or 12 months because guess what? There's no integrated housing or there's no provider who's willing to work with them and things like that. And so from an Olmstead planning perspective, I think systems need to think about, you know, that forensic population. When, when I was in New Jersey um, and we had had a, uh, a settlement agreement with the Baslon Center um, for folks who no longer needed uh, state hospital level of care, um, folks who... Um, had forensic backgrounds who no longer needed to be at the hospital um, were, were incorporated into that settlement agreement to facilitate their transition out into the community. So I think that the takeaway being essentially that, you know, once everybody sort of agreed that that person should go, that person should go and the system should be able to facilitate that. Um, in, in Philadelphia, um, even now, the, the court system continues to the, the behavioral system works with the court system, um, but there are also a lawsuit that, that helps speed that one up so that people who were in the state hospital or in any hospital in forensic units and they were there past the time they were required or the court had said that they could go, it really pushed the system to find integrated places for them to go. The key was it was housing that the court wanted to make sure was in place and an intensive support a case management system. With those two, the court was willing to work with the with the mental health folks around having people in the community. Great, thank you. And I think that it is 3:29. Um, so I don't know if Kelly, we have time for one more question, or we should wrap up. I think it'd be a quick question. That's fine. If you think it's going to take a little longer than that, we're going to need to wrap up. Okay, well, how about this one? Um, Eddie Systems just asked for clarification of the Medicaid buy-in proposal that Harvey had mentioned. 
What was the uh, question again, Jen? Oh, a clarification of the, you had mentioned the Medicaid buy-in proposal, yeah. and Eddie had asked about it, sort of in what, New it, what York, that was about. And I think it's different in different states, Eddie, but in New York, the number's gone up. This is a program that's been up for quite a while. If you have a SSI level psychiatric diagnosis um, and you work even a few hours, it's not a lot of hours per se, uh, you, you get to keep your Medicaid. Um, so there's a number of people who, and that helps you approximate getting, you know, take the steps. Back in the day, you could make up to $55,000 uh, as an individual and more as a couple and still keep your Medicaid. So it's it's a very um, generous program. I still think it's undersubscribed, um, mm -hmm. but it's a very exciting one. And it's been, uh, it's been a, made a real difference for a number of people who've used it. Okay, and I think that's the conclusion of our webinar, as we're out of time. Great. Well, I would like to take this time to thank our presenters today and our moderator. And I would definitely like to thank SAMHSA for allowing us to share this information with you today. Um, now I'm going to switch the screen to a short evaluation and ask that you take a few moments to fill this out for us. Again, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>